Chapter 2 Dark Continent When I agreed to go to Morocco with Akbar, I envisaged Dylan and the stones, souks and snake charmers, psychedelic colours and beautiful dancing girls. I also pictured hashish and freedom, lots of it, a carefree way of life. In the end, it would haunt me like a legacy from the devil himself. In the autumn of 1984, I was running away from nothing in particular. My life had taken another turn, and a gut-grown impulse sent me heading overseas with little money or direction. Several months earlier, I had received an SNLR, services no longer required, from the British Army. I'd eventually got what I wanted. And in May 1984, I kissed goodbye to my country's shilling and took up a permanent role among the ranks of the Stoke Hooligans, an army that gave me things in life that Her Majesty's had not. Acceptance, loyalty, and a sense of belonging. That summer had been a wild one. I grew my hair in Kevin Keegan fashion with the rest of the country, fought running battles on Blackpool's promenade with the lead service crew, and our firm, had its first ever holiday in Magaluf. Life was happening at an insatiable pace, and everything I tried, I did to excess. Our reputation around the potteries made regular reading in the tabloids, and my local reputation as the swashbuckling character Jasper was becoming synonymous with lawlessness. I provided the backdrop for a legend the people of Stoke-on-Trent wanted and created for themselves. As history depicts, every generation spawns one, and that's whether he wants it or not. After the Battle of the Mill, a huge fight at the Mill Country Club on the outskirts of my hometown, Old Sager, and the subsequent tragic suicide of its owner, the euphoria of my newfound freedom in Civvy Street ended abruptly. I decided to avoid any possible police repercussions, and so, not for the first time in my life, I find myself alone. Only this time, I would end up in a foreign country with little money and no knowledge of the language. I bypassed Spain's Costa del Sol and found myself back on my rock of hope, Gibraltar. It was familiar territory for me, having served on it several years earlier with the Staffordshire Regiment. Gibraltar, was far enough away from the uncertainties of Stoke, but a place I was comfortable with. I was certain that for now, this was the best place for me to be. I spared no time in finding an old drinking haunt of mine. I entered, as I had a thousand times before, stooping as I passed under a low, solid oak beam. Nothing had changed. It smelt the same and was as cool and refreshing from the street outside as always. I found a stool. The bar was shaped like the stern of a ship, clustered with brass bells, yarns of rope and seafaring memorabilia. It reminded me of Nelson's mess on his flagship victory. I was back in the Gibraltar arms. Funds were short. I'd arrived with less than 60 quid in my pocket and a return ticket to sell. Even so, I was parched, so I eyed up the Cruz Campo pump and winked at the barmaid, who looked Spanish. Here you go, lovey, that'll be 40 pence, ta. The accent was as harsh as a tequila slammer. Her name was Joanne. Her mates called her Jo, and she was from Leeds. Everyone knew Jo, and she knew everyone and everything. She was a quality acquisition on the first day. Things were looking up. Within an hour, she'd stopped charging me for the ale, told me she was good mates with the lead service crew and loved hoolies. She even found me a place to live. Another pint of Cruz Campo, please, love. I'll look for a job tomorrow. My first night's accommodation was in the middle of Jib's old town. Joe's flat was on the fifth floor. It had two bedrooms, and nine people lived in it. I was in luck, as someone had vacated their space that day. For £10 a week, I was offered the balcony that led off from the main living room. 
It was always full of washing, and people congregated on it to smoke spliffs and chat. I gave her twenty pound, and bedded down for my first night in the open, on the leather back seat from a car. For once it all fell into place very nicely for me. I even got eighty pound for my return ticket. Within two weeks, I'd cemented my presence amongst the English workers on the rock, found a job with the Ministry of Defence on the docks, and moved over the border to La Linea de la Frontera, a tough Spanish town with a merciless reputation. It had not been difficult to find unskilled work. If you were willing to graft for 20 quid a day and work alongside the North Africans, you could survive. Living in Spain on the cheap and working seven days a week, it was not long before I was starting to find my feet. I found my job the first day I went looking. Simon's construction was based on Devil's Tower Road at the foot of the rock. They offered me a position as a scaffolder's labourer. It was an immediate start, and by lunchtime I had met the company charge hand, Big Joe. Joe Edwards looked weathered and mean. The man like his frame, had a huge presence that carried weight. He had been residing on the rock for many years, and few questioned him. His eyes were bright blue and quick, and he spoke with a Stoke accent. I made sure Joe heard mine at the first opportunity, and we moved on from there. I got the feeling I wasn't the only one running from something. Big Joe was chuffed there was another Stokey on the rock. It turned out he was from the prefabricated Blurton estate and had been a hooligan himself in the early 70s. He even showed me an old black and white photograph of the legendary Coddy Hughes taken in his teens. They were old pals. I knew I was keeping good company and began to feel settled. I was even managing to save some money. Joe Edwards was good to me in many ways as I suppose I was to him. We shared a lot of bonds and became good friends. Even so, he was still my charge hand, and I never forgot that. It was only a matter of weeks before Joe gave me a break and put me with the scaffold team that worked on the docks. It was round-the-clock stuff. As one ship entered dry dock, we would scaffold for the welders to make repairs to the hull, always as quick as possible, before the ship met its deadline to sail and the next big tanker arrived. It was during this period that I met the Moroccan, everyone called Akbar. As a small boy, I used to watch a television show called The Banana Splits, in the days when children's entertainment was purely innocent animation. On that show was a cartoon called The Arabian Nights, and Akbar reminded me of a princely character from it. Pushing six feet tall, he had deep-set black eyes that mesmerised all. A perfectly trim black beard and moustache over a chiselled jawline, and his skin was dark and unblemished. I stared hard at the man, half expecting him to raise the palms of his hands to me and bellow out the command, Size of an elephant, as in the cartoon. He did not, and no magic carpet was summoned either. He was a mere scaffolder after all, and he spoke with a soft, gentle whisper in broken English. Big Joe wasn't one for formalities. Akbar was told my name was Jasper and I was his new labourer. Then Joe's rusty silver Nissan was gone. The big Moroccan offered me his hand and work duly commenced. Akbar climbed up on the first stage of scaffold and pointed down towards a pile of tubes. He gestured, and I passed them up to him. I was taken aback at how agile he was, and even more surprised that his work shoes were a pair of size 10 Adidas football boots with moulded studs. He wore a bright green, all-in-one boiler suit, and like most of the Moroccans, a little blue knitted hat at the back of his head. Several weeks passed, and little was said, until one day there was an accident. A German traveller, probably about my age, 21, was badly crushed when a huge piece of replacement steel hull fell from its hoist only yards from where we were working. Akbar and I stopped to look on with the rest of the dockers. We sat silently and shared a moment of sympathy for the crushed man. 
I think, from that moment on, the two continents and cultures that divided us were forgotten. Humanity sometimes needs to be forced upon us before we behave like humans. Working with Akbar changed after that day. We became friendly towards each other, and he taught me bits of Spanish. I was surprised by how many languages he could speak. He would even tell me about his life and how much he missed his family back home in Tetuan. Most afternoons were spent suspended high above the docks, the views of the Bay of Gibraltar, the Straits, and the far-off snow-capped Atlas Mountains were breathtaking. Africa made a great backdrop for my new friend's stories, and I would casually roll a big joint and smoke it while I listened to him intently. Life didn't get much better than this. I was happy, relaxed, and felt alive. I sat in the passenger seat listening to Joe passing wind. We were due to start a new job that day, and Akbar was late. It was most unlike the Moroccan, and Joe showed an unusual tolerance to the delay. He's here now, mate, I said. Joe wiped the tomato ketchup from around his mouth with a napkin, and we both got out of the car. The Moroccan looked flushed and fervent. He was holding a letter from home. The pair spoke briefly together in confidence. Then Joe bid us both adios. A week later, Akbar chose to share his good news with me. His clan were having a celebration for the homecoming of a nephew. He was serving in the Moroccan Coast Guard, and from what I could gather, was the pride of his family. Akbar invited me to go with him to Morocco, and I excitedly accepted the invitation. I suppose my persistent questioning over the next few days must have driven him insane. But all of a sudden, I've got a new mystical adventure ahead of me. I wanted to know everything. My country is the northernmost tip of Africa and the bottom lip of the Mediterranean Sea, he said. It was a geography lesson, my second favourite subject at school. Not surprisingly, Akbar, who was probably in his late thirties, was a very knowledgeable man. I was surprised to learn that his country had only a slightly bigger landmass than the state of California, a place that one day I knew I would visit. Joe wasn't surprised one bit when I told him I was going to Morocco. He told me to keep my eye on the little bastards and not to turn my back on one. They weren't all as sound as our friend. I already knew that, but I still took the advice on board. The day we left, I drew several hundred pounds out of my post office account on Main Street. We walked over the border to Spain and caught a packed bus to the port of Algeciras. It took an hour and the sun baked us. I spent the time examining my surroundings and listening to the flying burrito brothers on my headphones. Akbar sat quiet as always, away with his secret thoughts. The port was bustling. Spain lost its influence here, and Africa filled my senses. I was becoming spellbound. Akbar's mood also changed. We stood on the top deck, where it was cold and windy. He told me to listen carefully about his people and their ways. I am a Berber. His voice was firm and direct, yet confiding. I only speak with truth to you. Some people will see you as weak and an easy way of getting money. Think before you speak, my friend. He finished speaking, though our eye contact remained steady for several seconds. He shook my shoulder. He was sure I understood his meaning. I continued my gaze out to sea. Tangier was unnerving. The port looked like a refugee movie, with thousands of people clambering all over each other. Everybody had something to sell. Everybody wanted to speak to me personally. And all of a sudden, I was claustrophobic and increasingly volatile. Akbar pulled me from the dusty road and we found some space in a cafe. He ordered tea. We hatched our plan. We would sit a while 
and watched the street outside. He wanted me to see that it was just a fast pace and nothing was out of the ordinary. I couldn't believe how many donkeys had passed by, and more to the point, how many people were sitting on them. It was like looking back into medieval times. He needed to catch a bus. It was a two-hour journey by road to Akbar's hometown, Tetuan, and he so much wanted to see his wife and family. I wanted to score some hash and cradle a whore. The party was planned for three days' time, a Saturday, and I was going to do my own thing in Tangier and catch up with him in a couple of days. We bid each other farewell. The room above the cafe was basic. My friend had secured me two nights' lodgings before leaving. I showered off the sweat and grime from my journey, then put on my cargo pants and ventured out into a hectic tea-time rush hour. The evening chill was refreshing. I knew where my destination was for that night. I'd read about it and seen it in some of the old black-and-white 50s movies. Tangier was renowned for having some of the best hostlers in the world. It was a neutral, international zone and attracted characters from every walk of life. The Petit Socco area was one of the sleaziest squares on the planet and I reckoned I'd fit right in there, but I had to walk to get to it first. Every step I took, Ahmed was a step behind me. He stank of perspiration, his breath was rancid, and I took a dislike to the creature the minute I stepped onto the street. He was like a leech, and I couldn't burn him off. I had mixed feelings. I was part thrilled by my surroundings, but carried a slight mistrust and fear of the locals. Maybe I'd better suss this Ahmed out after all. For ten dirham, he said he would show me the way to Petit Socco. For another ten, he would show me the hotel where author William S. Burroughs wrote his novels. I was halfway to getting what I wanted and agreed to follow the man. He walked me around a labyrinth of pedestrian alleyways, the smell of human urine at times becoming overwhelming. Still, I pressed on, stepping over strips of cardboard and cloth, obviously some poor sod's bed for the night. By now I was so disorientated I needed Ahmed whether I liked it or not. He kept his word, and I appeared slightly dishevelled at the edge of the small square. That ten-minute walk had been nearly as bad as a solitary venture along Cold Blow Lane before a night fixture at Millwall. I sat in one of a multitude of small cafes and ordered a stork beer. Hamid gave strict orders for me to remain where I was while he fetched his friend who would sell me some keef. Hurry up then, you little bastard. I didn't like the man one bit. I took his absence as an opportunity to discreetly split my cash into two. I still had all three hundred on me. My musty room was so bare, there was nowhere to hide it. On my return from the convenience, I was joined at my table by two characters both European men in their fifties. They looked thoroughly acclimatised in their sweat-stained khakis and almost blended in with the rest of the film set. I have told Ahmed to wait out there, said one, nodding over his shoulder. I have paid him fifteen dirham. You can pay me later. My name is Jean. Jasper. I shook his hand and followed his nod towards the Moroccan. The other man, Claude, offered me his hand too, and each of us sat back in our chairs. I assumed they were Belgian. My mind raced through our military history, trying to determine whether my companions were allies or not. Fuck it, I thought. European is good enough for me around here. I decided against having a woman well over an hour ago. A couple of beers and a spliff back at my room would be enough for one night. I asked Jean how much an ounce would cost me. They both chuckled. I think the little skunk sat perched at the cafe window had given these punters the wrong impression. A drawn-out conversation commenced, and I started to look for my exit. The two Belgians started to explain to me about how things were run around these parts and how certain traditions must be kept. 
I knew I would at least be parting with a percentage of my money that night. I was just a bit worried that these two were going to try and palm a couple of kilos off on me. Three beers and three definite declines of offers later, I was beginning to lose my patience. Something was bothering me about these two. They were acting like they were heavy drug traffickers trying to sell me kilos of hash, yet they were drinking heavily and becoming loud and ostentatious. It didn't add up. From behind a heavy brow, I scrutinised them. I was a 21-year-old and didn't know then what I know now, but it suddenly dawned on me that I was in more danger than I was likely to be in a row about a bit of hash. I concentrated on the faces of the two Belgians. Something was missing. I saw them in more detail now. Their piercing blue eyes, their blonde moustaches and milky white skin. My gut was yelling at me. These are not normal men. With my confusion came fear. They laughed amongst themselves, slapping each other on the back. They leered at me through their laughter. Jesus Christ, I'm on the fucking menu here. The penny had dropped. I was definitely in way over my head and had to act fast. I weighed up my options. My natural instinct was to slam my bottle right across the middle of Claude's forehead and make a dash for it. But that was an absurd idea, and I had to repress the feeling immediately. What else? I couldn't think straight. My head began to reel. The beer, the climate, the situation. I began to sweat profusely. He never let me down. He swore he never would. And I never really understood why Steve Bloor took his own life. He was always stronger than me, and I looked up to him. As in life, in spirit, my old army pal Steve has never left my side, though he killed himself not long before I left the forces. To this day, he guides and protects me. He took a seat at the table next to me. We shared a warm smile of acknowledgement, invisible to the Belgians. Steve liked that. I stopped trembling and the sweat stopped stinging my eyes. I became calm and controlled, my breathing steadied. I offered them both another shot of whiskey. They drank it and I offered them some more. I was less worried about the Belgians now and more about Hamed, who was still hovering around outside. As long as I stayed put at the table, encouraging this pair to get even drunker, the more time I had to plan an escape. I sat uncomfortably and thought deeply. What if I told them I was going to get my friends who were after more hash than me? No, that would never work, and worse, it would give the game away that I was on to them. Could I remember my way back through the labyrinth if I made a run for it? No way. I would be seized by the Moroccans. I decided another trip to the cars he was needed and left the table without being excused. I didn't look back as the sound of laughter was replaced with a dark mumble. The window was far too small to climb through. Besides, behind it was pitch black. I cursed to myself. The toilet door opened and closed behind me and Jean appeared standing to my left. He began to pee. I watched him through the corner of my eye. He was vulnerable. What if I slammed a heavy kick into his knee straight across the joint? That would reduce my problem by a third. But for how long? And what if he started to squeal like a bastard? Anything I had ever done in my life that might help me resolve this problem was lost in time. I found myself opening up a conversation without choosing my words first. Where are we going after here? I asked while pretending to do up my fly. Jean leaned his face into mine and licked his top lip. His moustache was wet and tar-stained on the edges. Somewhere a little less busy 
We need to finalise our arrangement. What fucking arrangement is that? I thought as I blurted out my next sentence. I'd rather just go with you. I stared the man right in the eyes. His tongue appeared again briefly before he shook his head. We all go together, he hissed back at me. I could feel my heart jump a beat. I really did not like my situation one bit. I sat back down at the table. More beer had been ordered. I peeled the label and nervously drank from the bottle. I noticed that Hamid was now inside the cafe, perched at the bar. I got up and approached him. Hamid, if I give you two hundred dirham, can you get me a beautiful woman? I spoke through frozen lips. I was banking on the lure of the money. So far, Hamid had only earned fifteen dirham, and we were at least two hours into the ordeal. I was hoping he was as unscrupulous as he looked. Too fucking right he was. I ordered another couple of shots of whiskey and had it delivered to the table. Hamid spoke in Arabic to the man serving behind the bar, who nodded his head and looked hard at me. I began to believe that I was finally finding a solution. My chances of getting away from Hamid were greater than taking my chances with the two Belgians. Buying my way out was my only option. The man behind the bar poured my next drink into a glass and placed it in front of me on a beer mat. His finger remained on the mat, and as I looked down to pick up my glass, I saw the arrow immediately. I looked behind the bar to my right and eyed up the door. Hamid was gone. He reappeared seconds later, back outside the window. He stared at me without emotion. I waited and turned my attention to the Belgians. Neither one of them was actually frightening by their appearance. Physically, we were no mismatch, and I would have fancied my chances with either, or even both at the same time if I had to. It was just an accumulation of everything that was overpowering me. I was now placing my trust back in the hands of a man that a couple of hours ago I wanted to set fire to. I handed a twenty dirham note to the barman to cement our deal. Steve had been and gone, but I'd found my strength. I was alone again, and it was up to me now. Time was irrelevant. It seemed like an hour, but it could have been a couple of minutes. Claude rose from his seat, which was blocking the door to the cafe, and strode past me towards the lavatory. He made no attempt to speak. As the door closed behind Claude, Jean shuffled across into Claude's seat. His movement touched a nerve. The barman replaced the ashtray and dusted the table. For a split second, I lost sight of Jean, and I made my move. Vaulting the bar, I landed hard and awkward. The bottles I kicked over made an unearthly clatter as I struggled to find my feet. The door I'd been eyeing up was in touching distance. I wrenched it open and threw myself through it. At once, I could taste fear. I hurtled along the dim, narrow corridor and jumped down the stairs at the end in one leap. The open street ahead of me was insanely welcome just an eternity away. Three huge strides, and I was out. Ahmed grabbed my arm and pulled me, saying, Money, money. Yes, money, I give you money. Where now? Where now? I just want you to get away from the place fast. The sound of music and laughter, the smell of animals and leather, everything was spinning. There was no real panic. The Belgians were so inebriated they probably hadn't even noticed my flight. Yet Ahmed ushered me on at pace, away from any potential disruption to his earner. The maze of back streets took a turn. It had been light when I made my journey into Petit Socco. The lack of street lighting at just after ten o'clock gave the area a sinister aura. Which was apt, really, because now I was away from the two paedophiles or queers as I would have called them at the time. I was beginning to feel a bit sinister myself. Ahmed, you take me back to my room, yes? Then you go and get me a woman, yes? 
Then I give you the money. He wasn't going to have that suggestion. I didn't think for one minute that he would. I was buying time. Now, I was the hustler. I'd made up my mind as soon as I got to a spot that felt right for me. I was going to smash the filthy little bastard all over the place. He repulsed me. The opportunity arose sooner rather than later. I had found my bearings from the previous journey. My digs weren't far away. We crossed a cobbled courtyard. It was deserted. I struck without warning. Ahmed was still hanging on to the sleeve of my shirt when I smashed him in the nose with an upward swing of my elbow and dragged him down backwards onto the ground and stamped hard several times into his face, stifling any noises he made. He gurgled blood from his throat as I kicked him twice in the side of his head. I wanted to carry on and kill him. Nobody would have known or cared. Instead, I fled. That was enough. I'd quenched my raw animal instinct. I quickly collected my bag from my room and slung it over my shoulder. I wasn't staying there tonight. I wasn't even stopping in that town. I remembered the short walk back to the docks and hailed a taxi. Tetuan, I said to the driver. I didn't even ask how much. I didn't care. The journey, in silence, seemed to take a lot longer than it probably was. I took time to reflect. My attack on Hamid had been vicious. I wouldn't normally kick a man that many times in the head. Nevertheless, he had sold my soul without me putting it on the market, and probably for a lot less than the 200 that I'd offered him to do the dirty on the Belgians. For all he cared, I was going to be the sex victim of two unscrupulous nonces, then maybe even killed, and my body dumped off a cliff into the sea. Fuck him. He deserved it. The Petit Socco certainly lived up to its name, or maybe I was just unfortunate enough to run into bad company, as usual. All the same, I learnt a lesson there that night. I had come frighteningly close to a nightmare. Tetuan couldn't possibly be as bad as that den of iniquity. Could it? I journeyed on. I could see the spread of city lights embedded into the side of a mountain. I had arranged to meet Akbar in two days' time at the bus station. I thought it a better idea to break into my cache, find some secure accommodation and rest up for a day. He had grown up a mountain man, the eldest son of a Berber shepherd. Akbar spoke often of the Atlas Mountains. He told me that they were their natural barrier from their tempestuous neighbours, the Algerians. He seldom spoke of his wife Fatima, although he carried a picture with him always. I liked Akbar. I also liked the pension I was now booking into close to the main market square. 3.30 in the morning and the city was relatively quiet. By chance, the taxi driver who had not spoken one single word along the journey, had pulled over directly outside the small, clean-looking house with a sign written in English letters. Pension Bernadette. I read the piece of cardboard handed to me by the driver and gave him the 100 dirham he requested. An elderly French lady smiled as she showed me the way to a ground-floor single bedroom. We both smiled and nodded as I closed the door after her. I sat down at the side of the bed, staring at my hold all and clasping my head with sweaty palms. I was starving, had no fresh water with me, and was too tired and disorientated to venture out to search for any. Instead, I collapsed, fully clothed, and buried my head deep into the solitary pillow. I was wiped out. I slept undisturbed for more than twelve hours. The sun hammered through the shuttered window. I woke up drenched in sweat, with a blistering headache. Completely drained of energy, I pulled myself onto the floor and stood up to make my way to the sink in the corner of my room. I staggered twice, then shocked myself when I released a stream of diarrhoea down the inside of each of my legs. 
It turned cold within seconds and became excruciating. I sank into despair when I looked at the bed and saw it was covered in wet excrement. I'd been lying in my own liquidised body waste for hours. I summoned the strength to pull the sheets from the bed and throw them in the corner of the room. They were sodden, as was I. I peeled my clothes from my shit, stinking body and replaced them with clean ones from my bag. With no hot water or shower at hand, they were pulled over the mess I'd made. I didn't care. I just needed to get warm. I was starting to shiver uncontrollably and my teeth began to hammer against themselves. The small claustrophobic room began to spin. I lost consciousness. I must have just dropped to the floor where I stood. When I came round, the sun had moved on and the room was full of late afternoon shadows. Lord knows how long I had laid on the floor. I pulled myself up onto the bed and lay in the fetal position, rocking myself gently and began to slowly peel my sponge-like tongue from the roof of my mouth. I was parched. My head was painful and leaden. I felt completely lost and close to panic. I could not move to help myself. I remained delirious for most of the day and evening, desperately dehydrated and suffering from a mild form of acute mountain sickness. At times, I thought that maybe this was going to be my final resting place, a cheap pension in a far-off mountain city in North Africa. It wasn't really what I had planned. I was far too young to die, and besides, I still had not seen Stoke City lift a trophy at Wembley. For most of the day, I could hear the soft sound of a French radio station playing in reception, but my crippling stomach cramps prevented me from hailing to any of the people who came and went. The only thing between me and salvation was a closed door. It was soul-destroying. I heard the turning of the handle. I barely opened my eyes. The vile stench of my excrement had reached beyond the room to save my life. It was well into the early hours, and I remember little other than the sound of two soft female voices. One French, the other Arab. Later, I decided that being able to sit up in bed without being bent over double in pain was the best feeling in the world. They fed me broth and fruit, mopped my brow with cool aloe vera, and tended to me for hours. I was extremely grateful and mightily humbled by the experience. I left him at Akbar, light-headed and weak, but feeling a thousand times better than I had a couple of days previously. He moved graciously towards me through the bustling market. I stood firm leaning against the post he had told me to find and not to move away from. His huge smile lifted my spirits. Akbar told me I'd look frail and that we should go to his home immediately. He was concerned, which kind of worried me. I remember little, if anything, of his family got together, although each member of his family was introduced. I rested up for a couple of days in a makeshift shelter Akbar had erected for me on the roof of his house. It consisted of a large one-piece fly sheet thrown over a line and secured and was the size of a garden shed. Laid out on the floor were reed mats and several huge comfortable pillows. If I had not felt so shitty, I would have likened it to a harem. But for the moment, it was just a welcome bed. Akbar and Fatima had four sons, the eldest being Yusef. It was he who took over the role of head of family while his father was working away in Gibraltar. He was 14. Akbar's visit home was short. He needed to get back and earn money. He encouraged me to stay, however, and get better, during which time Yusef would show me their culture. I agreed to stay. I was beginning to get my strength back, and I wanted to get on with my journey of life. I began to enjoy the Moroccan lifestyle. Several weeks passed and I familiarised myself with my surroundings. Tetuan was a flat city with few buildings above five storeys. The skyline, 
was mostly dominated by mosques, and at night I would lie inside my tent, smoking keef, looking up at the stars and listening at what the city threw at me. It could be quite haunting. During the days, I would sit on my haunches, smoking keef through a hooker pipe and drinking mint tea with Akbar's extended family. It was whilst doing this that I met Simi, Akbar's youngest brother. At first I wasn't sure whether I liked Simi. He was far more westernised than anyone else I had met, quite trendy with his fashion. He had slick back hair, wore lowest jeans with leather loafers, t-shirts and a black leather bomber jacket. I did like the jacket, but again, I wasn't sure whether the man liked me. I decided to treat him with much more caution than the rest. You need to be wary of anyone with that many scars on his face. A month went by. I had given Yusef the equivalent of a hundred pound to give to his mother towards my board. Every time I asked if they wanted some more money, they refused and smiled saying enough, enough. It was an easy existence and I was loving it. And more to the point, nobody in the world knew where the hell I was. I got to know Simi better quite out of the blue. I had noticed him trying to read my tattooed arms on a number of occasions. Eventually, I lifted my arm for him to see. His English was better than I had first given him credit for, unless he had just chosen the moment when to use it. He asked me about the British Bulldog and the inscription above it. Stoke. Stoke City. I read slowly as I ran my finger along it. English football team, very good in England. Me, English football hooligan, yeah? You know hooligans? Simi laughed in acknowledgement, nodding his head with a huge smile. We both laughed, him more than me. We had touched base. Simi told me he was a football supporter, but not a hooligan. His local team was Maghreb de Tetuan. He said, that they were playing their rivals Itahad Tangier soon and we should go and watch. I was chuffed at the suggestion and toked hard on the hooker pipe. That night, Simi showed me how he earned his living. Tetuan was a vibrant place in its own right, though less geared up for tourism than Tangier. Nevertheless, when the odd unsuspecting Westerners showed up in search of their own elusive grail, they fell victim to Simi's thieving ways. Over the next week I ventured out at night with him and hung with his crew. I christened them the Hawks. Their favourite victims were very similar to how I had been in Tangier, mostly male travellers looking for some dope or a brothel. They would befriend them and promise to take them away from all the street hustling and barging about, take them to a back street cafe, and tell them to wait on the promise of some of the finest hashish in Morocco. They would always leave someone to watch and protect their quarry from other sharp eyes. After some time, Simi would return to the cafe on the back of a moped. He would always look perturbed, like he had gone so far out of his way to accommodate their request. Each time, he tried to push the amount of dope wanted even higher. In my naivety, the first time I saw them do it, I actually thought it was a straight bit of business. I sat with a couple of the hawks in a cafe opposite, our eyes trained on four teenage Israelis. They looked relaxed and drank tea whilst awaiting their hashish. In time, the moped clattered to a stop on the dusty rock-strewn road and Simi coolly stepped off the back and swaggered inside the cafe sat down and ordered tea. He kept the Israelis waiting, spinning his spiel and exaggerating his concerns about the street outside. The travellers eventually conceded to his persistence and accepted two nine bars of hash wrapped in gold and green silk scarves. Simi shoved the cash inside his jacket pocket, jumped back on the waiting moped and left. The two hawks I was with remained seated and composed as they watched. I did the same. The Israelis began to gather their belongings for their exit. 
almost immediately, one, then the other, sharply took to their seats again. They looked ruffled. I stared on. Four police officers entered the open-fronted cafe, each taking off his hat and placing it on a vacant table. They sat down. The Israeli teenagers looked perturbed, their discomfort blatantly apparent. They reached for empty teacups and pretended to drink. None spoke a word. I still hadn't fully switched on with what was unfolding in front of me, but shared the teenager's dismay when one of the soiled-looking police officers left his table and approached them. The hawks next to me fidgeted excitedly in their seats. Passports, s'il vous plaît. The officer gesticulated for each to show their ID. Each of the four handed their blue passports to the man, who then sat back down with his colleagues and began to examine them thoroughly. The four friends sat nervously awaiting their fate. Four sets of chair legs scuffed the worn wooden floor as the police all stood up together. Their approach was slow, and their search of the Israelis' bags methodical. The silk scarves were placed on the table in front of the ashen-faced friends. Each had frozen, and three were now crying. They were collectively stood up and marched away from the cafe, led along a packed avenue and disappeared amongst a throng of jostling bystanders. One policeman remained seated at his table, one foot on the floor, the other stretched out across a chair. He looked smug. The sound of a moped brought movement from the hawks. I stood too. Again, Simi stepped off his pillion and entered the cafe. He sat down at the table and spoke with the bent copper. In the blink of an eye, their dealings were done. Simi left the scene. We followed on foot. Back at their barber shop HQ, the door shutters were pulled too. The rewards were then split amongst a six strong gang. In effect, they had come out of the scam with the two bars of hash they had started with, plus half of the money taken from the Israelis. I sat and said nothing. All of a sudden, I didn't like the gang I was in anymore. Still, I found it amazing to watch as they celebrated their triumph with a Berber throat cry. I got a gut feeling that Simi, in some kind of a way, was taunting me. I skinned up a joint and smoked it. I watched the Hawks for over a fortnight and even picked up a bit of their language. They were all excellent pickpockets and drew no line whatsoever on who their next target would be. When I attended the much-awaited Tetuan v Tangier game, they pilfered at least a dozen wallets. The game itself was the real first reminder of home since I left Europe. Any preconceptions I had before the game were dispelled on entering the ramshackle stadium. It was open at all ends, with grass growing through cracks on most of the parched terrace steps. A far cry from Stoke City and its booth and end packed to the rafters with 15,000 expectant fans. Then again, I thought, where else in the world would you find that kind of passion other than in Stoke? I rested my case and continued to examine the sparse crowd. There were maybe 3,000 people in there, with probably 200 from Tangier. All were male, so there was still a little chance of a bit of crowd disorder. The first 15 minutes of the game were dominated by the away side, but the Hawks paid little attention to the game, or me. One of them had spotted an unsuspecting and lucrative-looking target. The English couple away to our left stuck out like sore thumbs. The fella even had a big camera hanging around his neck. They looked in their late twenties, the arty type. She looked decidedly nervous as she watched her partner become embroiled in a one-way conversation from the gutter. I could tell from their attire and the way they held themselves that the pair were clean living people and had no understanding of the streets and its perils. I'm from the street and I'd been suckered twice already. 
They might be worried for their purses and passports, but would have no idea at all that they would soon be on their way to a Moroccan jail. It was too much for my conscience. I got it in my head right away that no way would I let my own countrymen fall prey to the hawks. Rather than alarm them straight away, I spoke to Simmy and played on the fact that one of them was a woman. Simmy's English was suddenly minimal again. I did not even bother to say that they were from my homeland, as if they cared. This was going to be a good earner for the Hawks. They had just robbed their own people blind during that match. They certainly didn't care about two Westerners, and that camera would fetch a fortune. At the final whistle, I made my move. Hello, how did you find the game? I imposed my handshake on the Brit. Oh, fascinating, a bit different to back home. At once, I detected a West Country accent. The woman looked pleased I had appeared. Where are you from back home? I carried on my chat as I walked along Simmy's sidekick, Mustafa. It was his scam. He tried to move me on to one side and pick up his spiel on the couple. Look, if you're wanting some ash, I've got about five grams in my pocket. You're welcome to it. Or I'll just bite you a chunk off if you like. I was desperately wanting them to say yes, because failing that, I was going to have to tell them out loud that they were being set up for a scam. I was hoping I wouldn't have to do that, as it could cause us all to be the victims of a brutal street mugging there and then. Plus, after that, I would have to face the consequences of Simi and his cronies. Disappointingly, he refused my offer and went on to tell me that Sandra, his fiancée, an old school friend, wanted to take some slippers home for her mother. Fuck me, this is getting worse, I thought to myself, as we breached the stadium wall and approached the bustling streets outside. Mustafa began to hail taxis to speed away his victims to his uncle's slipper shop. He was well on to me, as were the rest of the hawks. They commandeered bicycles and pedalled out of sight. Hey, thanks for the offer. Nice chatting to you. The gawky-looking Englishman bumped his head on the roof of the car as he sat down on the back seat next to Mustafa, who had strategically placed himself in the middle. They shared a laugh. I saw him leave with a smug smile on his face, content that he had now finally snared his victims. I saw him as a sly, stinking bastard, and I wanted to kick his fucking head in. I was coming to the end of my time in Morocco. I could feel it. The taxi pulled away in a swirl of dust, leaving me standing in a busy North African street. Sandra stared back out of the window whilst Mustafa placed his arm around her fiancé's shoulder. I caught her lost stare and gave her the thumbs-down signal. Whether she ever responded to it, I will never know. The night sky over Tetuan was as bright as I had seen during my two-month stay in North Africa. I lay back on my pillows and searched for guidance under a multitude of spangled stars. I was stoned again. It had been more than a week without any sign of Simi after the football running. I could only assume that they had pulled off a successful scam of the English couple, or else they might have paid me a visit. I'd drunk about as much mint tea as I could take by now, had scores of cooking lessons from Fatima, and played in goals for Youssef and his back alley select a hundred times. In the morning, I was going to pay my thanks and wish them all farewell. Final decision. I decided to smoke myself into oblivion that last night on the roof. I had more than half an ounce of Keef and thought better of attempting to take it back into Europe. I decided to make use of my new clay chalice and smoke it as neat as I could get it. It was not long before I was in a deep sense of anxiety at the sounds inside my head. For two months I had slept out in the open above the majestic city. It had thrown many strange sounds up at me whilst emptying its bowels in the dead of night. None so strange, though, as the ones that had me straining my senses the way it did that night. Demonic forces were at work, and I was about to be thrown into the pit of hell amongst them. A rampant tomcat, I first thought. Then, no, 
it began to sound like a child sobbing. I crushed out my spliff and crawled out of my shelter. I stood up slowly, hardly daring to make any sound. The night had an unearthly feeling to it. I felt frightened and uneasy. I walked around the rooftop slowly, stopping every few yards to strain my hearing. There it was again, a child's cry. It was hauntingly familiar. The layout of Akbar's house was unlike anything we had at home. Covering three floors, most of the living space was below street level, with the cooking and washing area taking most of the first floor. In the two rooms above lived his other family members, and above them, his four children. The rooms were sparse, the corridors narrow and tiled. The doorways were arches with heavy curtains for doors. There was no electricity, or the lighting was either natural or candle. At night, the house was spooky. I much preferred being in the open, up on the roof. I leaned on the door handle and took my time to lift it off its latch. I was going to go inside and see if one of the boys was having a nightmare or a fever. I trod carefully down a set of moonlit stairs and walked at a snail's pace along the confined corridor to where the children slept. If one of the boys was having a bad dream or a fever, why was I treading so lightly? My senses were telling me that something did not add up. I froze. There it was again. I held my breath and cursed my heart for beating so loudly. I was sure I had heard something else this time. I remained still, inches from the doorway, wanting to pull the curtain to one side and walk in, but not having the courage. The sound of shuffling, a boy's whimper, a man's grunt of sexual satisfaction. I gulped hard and remained frozen to the icy stone wall. I began to tremble uncontrollably. Oh, my God. Funny, isn't it? You don't bother going to see him, but he's the first person you call for when you need serious help. On reflection, I was utterly confused. I certainly wasn't prepared for what I might see. My guts told me it would be bad. My heart told me not to turn away. I reached slowly for the curtain and held it for some time before I pulled it slowly to one side. It was like going over the top at the Somme. Once I had made my move, I was going in. The room was moonlit, full of hazy shadows and stank of alcohol and sweat. The three youngest boys all sat tightly together in the corner of the room their backs up against the walls, their knees pulled tightly up into their chests, their heads and faces buried deeply behind their legs. None of them made a sound. Movement tore my stare away from them and into the centre of the room. Mortified, paralysed, I cringed at the scene taking place ahead of me on the floor of the room. Yusef, Akbar's eldest son, looked small and limp, his face harrowed and tortured. He made no expression as I stared into the face of his uncle behind him. Simmy's face hung clear over the boy's shoulder. He was naked. His body glistened with sweat. His mouth hung open. His evil eyes burnt me up. I screamed without making a sound. I couldn't speak. No word could leave my lips. My limbs felt like lead. I cried, but no tears fell. I'm ashamed to say, I stood and watched. Simmy could see my distress. He knew from then on that I was going to do nothing. He continued to abuse the boy in front of me, pumping hard, then slowing his strokes. He gyrated behind Yusef, his face contorted with evil pleasure. The sweat continued to roll down his brow. I could not remove my stare from the man's eyes. I was transfixed, 
denying myself the torture of seeing Yusef's desperate face once again. Simi grunted with pleasure. A sick smile covering his face, he began to speak to me in Arabic. His voice had a demonic undertone to it. He climaxed inside his nephew and immediately stood up and faced me. Yusef lay motionless at his feet. I said nothing, turned and left the room. Back in my tent, I packed my chalice with Keef. My hands shook as I lit it. My mind was full of sick panic. I began to race away from me. Oh my God, what had I just seen? It was beyond my comprehension. Several times over the months, I had heard noises in the dead of night, but had no idea what may have been taking place, only a matter of yards away from me. I started to fill up with emotion. What on earth was the solution? What could be done to help these poor children? Anger started to build up inside of me. All of a sudden, I wanted to kill the bastard. What else could I do? So many questions, so few answers. A multitude of scenarios flashed through my mind, all with the same ending. Bloodshed and a lifetime of incarceration inside a Moroccan jail. I fingered the bone handle of my lock knife. I had carried it with me ever since my first night in Spain when I witnessed the brutal killing of a Spanish contraband smuggler. Until now, I had no cause to use it. At that moment, I wanted to cut Simmy's bollocks off with it and put them in his mouth. I purposefully cut my finger, placed it in my mouth and drank the blood. On reflection, I suppose I just felt the need to draw blood in one way or another. Reality sank in, thankfully. I now hated Simmy more than I hated anything else in the entire world and that included the person that by rights should have been my world, my own bloodline. I felt an immense sadness for Yusef and his brothers. I can only assume that the other three boys would be subjected to the same abuse soon, if not already. If I killed Simi, I would never get out of the country. I would be a murderer. I might even face execution. If I left without a word, I would be condemning the children to a lifetime of sexual depravity. Either way, it was a no-win situation. I was still a condemned man, guilty of doing nothing, sentenced to carry a tombstone weighted with guilt with me for the rest of my life. And believe me, at times, it's weighed heavy. I left Etoine that very night, on foot. I walked for some time, just walked. At first light, I, along with several others, jumped onto the back of a truck, heading for the port of Suta. I said nothing, just stared. Occasionally, I picked dust particles from the corner of my eyes. For three nights, I slept on a deserted beach before I finally mustered the strength to make the ferry journey back over to Algeciras. Still, I said nothing, not one word to a single soul. I walked from Algeciras to La Linea. It took me over eight hours. So what? I wasn't in any rush to get anywhere. I slept heavily that night, and the next day crossed the border to Gibraltar and emptied my post office account. I was going to hit the road for a while, and I had no room for any passengers. My Moroccan nightmare. They say it helps to put things down in words sometimes and I would have to agree with that to a point. I exercised several ghosts from my life in the writing of Naughty. Some might say I've now put them all to bed forever. Reliving this story, however, I feel has made me feel worse. I'm an older man now. I'm as hardened to life as we all are. We've got to be. Child abuse is a worldwide disease. It's more than probable that it takes place under your very own noses as it did mine. What are you going to do about it? Run out and attack your neighbour, or turn a blind eye, thankful that it's happening to someone else and not you. Ask yourself the question. I turned my back and walked away from what I felt would end up a life sentence in a Moroccan jail, 
despite the fact that by that action I may have been sentencing those boys to years of sexual abuse at the hands of their own uncle. For that, I am deeply sorry. The incident has affected me ever since. And for the record, I feel no better for writing about it. How could I? <laughs>